I look out the window and it's the whole, like there's just like fire outside my window up, up the whole mountain. And I was like, what the f Wildfires are unpredictable. That's a large part of what makes them so dangerous. Yeah. It's happening. It's happening. I was in a forest fire like two years ago. It was in um, upstate New York. I was staying at Menla, which is a retreat center run by Bob Thurman, who also happens to be Uma Thurman's dad, which is where the Dalai Lama often stays when he's in the U.S. It's full of beautiful antiques and artifacts that were rescued from Tibet during the Chinese invasion in the 1950s. So yeah, I did not want that burning down on my watch. I never expected to actually fight a wildfire, but now that I have, I can clearly see how much more help is needed to combat these ever too common disasters. But recent advancements in technology are helping us to react faster, better understand the scope, and even predict where fires will happen before they start. It turns out that one of the best ways to fight fire is with fire. One of the most dangerous jobs fighting fires is being part of the air crew. More than 26% of wildfire accidents are related to aviation. With the extreme heat, low visibility, and numerous other factors, it's a job that carries a very high level of risk. Thankfully, that's where drones come in. It could be the key to preventing a small brush fire from turning into a big one. Drone technology. The drone. Drones in Eyes action. Eyes in the sky when it comes to battling fire. The latest drone battling California wildfires and more. All of us are probably aware of drones by this point. We've covered them in several videos here on Mobile Zero. But the ways they're being used by both researchers and on the ground crews to gather information and even battle fires is on another level. Using drones has already proven to be an effective way to reduce risks for crews, all while increasing their output. These are dragon eggs. They might look like oversized paintballs, but they're actually tactical explosives used to set controlled fires. They're loaded into a drone and carefully dropped to wipe out dry vegetation, starving wildfires of their fuel. That's right, these drones are fighting fire with fire. Dragon eggs have been used for a long time to prevent fires from spreading, but using them requires flying at low altitudes, adding significant risk for pilots. Drones allow for pilots to remain firmly planted on the ground while delivering precise control over the balls of fire but their uses go far beyond dragon egg run. Drones offer a bird's eye view that's traditionally required airplanes or helicopters. Not only do drones save pilots from having to fly over the fires, they keep runways open for water bombing runs and evacuation flights. They can also get much closer to the critical areas without risk, including canyons and caverns that can't be seen by other aircraft. Larger drones are even being used to douse fires while crews rest in the evening. And that's all thanks to infrared and thermal cameras. I was on retreat and it was like a super, like up in the Catskills, like in the, so it's like a little tiny valley-ish in the middle of these mountains. And there was only like five or six of us on the whole compound and there's like these little houses and retreat places. And I was in this one the furthest away. And like at night, it was like, I was going to bed, it was like midnight, and I was like, I smell fire. There's one other person in the house with me. He was like in the basement, and I was like, is he burning incense or something? After the immediate threat of fire around the house was put out, the rescue team that was with me in the Catskills used drones to scour the mountain to find any remaining pockets of fire they might have missed, because one small patch can quickly grow out of control. One of the most difficult aspects of fighting fires is understanding their movement and scope. Aerial photography can offer real-time feedback to the crews on the ground, giving them the ability to assign resources where they're needed most, even in the dark. But those cameras are also being used by frontline crews. Visibility is a serious issue, even in the daytime, due to heavy smoke. So having handheld infrared cameras that can see through the smoke can make a world of difference. And thermal cameras are quickly becoming an essential part of every wildfire crew kit. Whether used as a handheld camera or as a smartphone attachment, they're used to spot heat below the surface that can't be seen, one of the major causes of recurring fires. These underground flames are also known as zombie fires. And yes, they are just as terrifying as they sound. They are the remains of fires that have been extinguished on the surface, but remain burning below. They can last months or even years if not dealt with. Thermal imaging gives firefighters the ability to spot these zombies and dig them up before they start roaming the surface again. And I mean that literally. A recent method that has helped reduce recurring fires is excavating fires by digging them up with heavy machinery and dousing them with massive amounts of water to ensure they don't ignite again. After all, 
the most effective way to fight a fire is to stop it before it starts. 2023 has been declared the worst year ever for wildfires in Canada. Threatened by wildfires in the West are finally getting some relief. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. AI. Artificial intelligence. AI technology is now part of the firefighting team. Mike Flanagan, a professor of woodland fires at the University of Alberta, is developing an AI program that will be able to predict forest fires faster and more accurately than human analysts. Being able to crunch data at a rate that humans simply can't, the AI will see patterns that our current models have missed. The program uses historical weather data, topographical data, and current weather patterns to predict extreme fire hazards. I look out the window and the whole, like, there's just like fire outside my window up, up the whole mountain. And I was like, what the f I would go downstairs, wake him up, and we just like throw shit in my car and like drive down the mountain to like the, you know, like the reception house or whatever, but there's no one there. It's, when Flanagan spoke to the CBC about his program, he said that it looks for extremes, dry windswept forest and a spark, because that's all it takes. If there's fuel and a spark, something as simple as a car pulled off to the side of the road and a hot exhaust pipe making contact with dry growth, it can lead to the rapid spread of fire. Knowing the locations that are at the highest risk can help crews to prepare. The program has been in development for five years and will likely be ready in another three to five years for real world use. Another program known as FireMap is being developed in the US. It collects data from sources such as 911 data centers and mountaintop cameras that have been trained to scan for smoke. It pulls data from localized weather reports and real time aircraft reports and cross references all of the data to triangulate the location of the fire. Of course, these are paired with existing research models and imaging that organizations such as the Canadian Forest Service and Environment Canada are currently using. So I just like get behind the desk and I call 911 and it's like, she's like, okay, we're gonna have to send fire from like all the surrounding like little tiny villages, but she's like, no one will be there for like a half an hour. Firefighters, researchers, and analysts all work together to determine the severity and risk of wildfires because the reality is we can't put out every fire, nor would we want to. Many ecosystems rely on fires, and putting out fires that don't pose a risk can actually lead to more dangerous fires in the future, as we saw with the dragon eggs and the dry brush. Determining which fires to tackle is a challenge, but one of the best tools for evaluating the scale and positioning of fires is satellite imagery. While drones are an effective aid for crews on the ground, having a satellite that can relay information without needing to refuel or be controlled can be essential. The problem is that current satellite data is often hours or even days out of date by the time it reaches crews. That's about to change thanks to a satellite being developed at the Great Lakes Forestry Center in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. This new satellite will monitor and relay information in real time, allowing crews to respond to changes in weather and spread patterns as they happen. At $50 million, it's not a cheap piece of tech, but compared to the infrastructure and human cost, it's a tiny expense. And it's a tiny device, relatively speaking. According to Josh Johnston, an analyst from the team, the satellite is about the size of a dishwasher. But these new technologies can't be at every fire right when it starts. And sometimes the best technology is a shovel and a bucket, as I quickly learned. So we drove back up the mountain and started like scoop, like throwing water to save the house, <laughs> like throwing water all around the house and like trying to dig a trench and stuff. It was All that. At least we got it in time. Thankfully, after about a half an hour of just me and my friend fighting the fire by ourselves, a small three-person team showed up from a neighboring town and brought lots more water. And then more firefighters arrived on the scene to help over the next few hours, so they saved the house. But I still had to sleep in my car. And there's one last piece of tech that's significantly improving our ability to safely deal with fires. Smartphones. Never before has the dissemination of information been easier. Real-time reports sent via text and social media are keeping residents in alert zones up to date. Seeing the images out of Kelowna, the Northwest Territories, and Europe this year has been humbling. But being able to keep in touch with those affected makes me thankful that we live in the age that we do. For communities located in at-risk zones, emergency websites are often created to communicate essential information. In the case of the wildfires in the Okanagan, CordEmergency.ca provided a variety of tools, including an interactive map, a newsfeed, and preparation checklists. On a broader scale, news agencies such as the CBC often have region-specific reports that are shared as daily briefings on YouTube in case you don't have access to a TV. But Twitter, or X as it's now called, 
is still your best bet for real-time updates. Finding and following specific hashtags relating to your community can give insights into what's happening. And oftentimes those updates are faster than official resources. Just remember to mute our Musk overlord. Technology is empowering us to contain fires like never before. And it's empowering me to purchase that infrared camera I've always wanted. That's in the budget, right? What else can we be doing to prevent wildfires? And what cool technology should I dig into next? Please let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of The Tech Effect every other Friday. I'm Tasha the Amazon. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to check out my episode on e-waste. I'll see you around. As a rewind. Evaluating the scale and position in. Oh, I don't know. I can't use the words today.